ready or not, it's already time to send the kiddos back to school. You did it this morning. Yep. Joining us today, good friend of the show, Rob Volpe. And Rob, how do we help our kids as they transition from all this freedom of the summer back to rules and classrooms and teachers? There's so much transition that happens today in particular if your kids have just gone back. But even in these few weeks, there's changes in schedule for everybody. New teachers, new students. You might even be going to a new school. That can bring up a lot of emotions. Um, Zura, you were talking about the excitement that your kids felt today, which is awesome. And you want to try to get that to continue. I know. I want to capture it and keep having that energy throughout the days and the weeks and the months. And that, that might be hard because what if first day isn't exactly what you expect? Right. And so it's so important to help your kids feel supported um, and to feel like they've got a safe place in the home. Um, there's a lot of studies that have come out. There's one study, actually, that found high school students, 40% of high school students have persistent feelings of mm -hmm. sadness and hopelessness. And another 20% of youth, 12 to 17 years old, um, have had major depressive experience in the past year. So there's a lot of things going on, and we want it's so it's important, particularly in times of transition, like back to school, to really connect with your kids, hold space for them so that they can share how they're feeling. Rob, how many of those kids going through that are sharing it with their parents? I mean, not as many as you would like, uh, obviously enough that it shows up on some studies, but kids will often hold things back. And so it's important for the parents to shift how they're talking to their kids to try to get them to open up a little bit more. Um, so when I pick up my kids, what should be a question I should be asking? So, you know, obviously, how was your day? Tell me about that. Ask about their favorite this, that, you know, teacher. Subject, teacher. Subject, news, who are the new students um, in the class? Because there's always people coming in and out. And then continue those conversations as the weeks are progressing. I think the big thing as, you know, today's a rosy day for everybody, fresh start, clean slate. Um, but their job is to get the grades, as Nisha, you said. <laughs> and it's true. So eloquently. <laughs> said to my daughter yesterday. And so if you think about like in all of our jobs that we have, things aren't always going smoothly. So you want to ask the kids, so when they do come home with a problem or an issue, whether it's a, a bad grade or difficulty um, with a classmate, don't ask why. That's the, the big thing I'd like people to take away. Don't ask the, and use the word why. You want to try to understand why, but why puts us on a defense, on the defensive. It makes kids uh, feel like, if you think about it, when they get in trouble, they've done something wrong. I'm glad you reminded us about that because a lot of times we will say why and our intention is pure or our intention is to have that understanding, but it comes across not so. Like you're digging deeper, but that's not how it's perceived. Exactly, exactly. And instead, um, because kids understand why, like why did you draw on the wall and crayon? Why were you late? Why did you fail that test? It puts you on the defensive and you feel like you've got to come up with a good excuse. Otherwise, there's going to be punishment. So instead, and what I talk about in the book and what parents have told me they've taken away from reading the book is that it's about using different words. You can even just ask, tell me more about what happened in English class or say, how did that, what happened so that you ended up being late instead of saying, why were you late? Or how could I help you? It seems accusatory yeah. versus, hey, tell me more, describe it to me. Exactly. And you mm -hmm. can have the best intentions, but recognize that your child is their own individual and human being. And so the ways that they're picking up and, and hearing things are very different. And then it's the act of listening. It's yes. not waiting to say the next thing, but actually hearing what they're saying. Exactly. Put the phone down, pay attention, ask the questions, repeat back what you're hearing from them so that they know that they're being heard. Ultimately, we want kids to flourish. And flourishing is about when they're able to complete tasks, where they're able to handle challenging situations, being calm and collected. Uh, and they're, they're, they're thriving, ultimately. But to do that, they've got to be connected uh, to the the family unit and the family itself has to have resilience. I love that so much. A great reminder as we are stressed out this week, perhaps, and a lot of emotions up and down. So yes. thank you so much. And what I do like in our school district, they have no phone policy. Oh, so wonderful. that's a biggie. Yeah. That's new when it comes to mental health.
Well, they've had it, but I think now is the time where they're actually like strict, strict about, it. about it. And so to that point, there's, a, there's two books which we showed uh, going into the last break that I would recommend parents pick up. One is called Boy Mom, which is all about raising boys in today's uh, world where definitions of masculinity are changing. And also Jonathan Haidt has a book called The Anxious oh, Generation. I love, I love him. So Jonathan. important. He goes into all the research to understand how social media and technology is affecting children, leading to some of those mental health issues that the kids are having. I also like this book as well. Yes. And I would recommend it. Tell me more about that. Thank Rob, you. that's your book. And we'll put all the info on our website, abc4.com slash GTU. All right.